Father, we praise you and thank you again for the privilege and the opportunity of gathering around your word. It is our continuing and sincere desire to know you more perfectly, that we may serve you more faithfully. We thank you again and again that we can call you Abba Father and that you're not ashamed to call us and own us as your very own children, your very own redeemed and blood-washed family. We thank you for Jesus, our great Redeemer, our High Priest, and someday our coming King for all that he has done, for all that he is doing, and for all that he will do when he returns to receive us to himself. We thank you for the Holy Spirit whom you have sent into our midst to be our teacher and to be our guide. We know that without his anointing, we can do nothing as we ought to do it. Without his inspiration and revelation, we can know nothing as we ought to know it. But we do rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory that he is here and that he will guide us into the truth. I thank you that even now he is anointing every ear to hear and every heart to believe. And I thank you that my lips are now anointed to speak your word, that I will speak it accurately, and that revelation knowledge would flow freely in this service tonight, unhindered and unchecked by any force. And in obedience to your word, we covet earnestly the best gifts of the Spirit, that they would be in operation and in manifestation, that the needs of this assembled body may be met in a supernatural way. I personally thank you that your word declares that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Therefore, with great boldness and confidence, I look to the greater one who indwells me. And I know that he will think through my mind. He will speak through my lips and he will minister through this vessel of clay to your people. And for all this shall be revealed and for all this shall be manifested, we promise and covenant with you now in advance before we ever begin that we will give you alone all of the praise, the glory, the honor, the adoration, and all of the thanksgiving, for we ask it in that name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. And all who agreed with that prayer said, Amen. Then they said, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Then they said, Glory to, God. Glory to God. Then they said, Good evening, Fred. Good evening, Fred. Good evening y'all. <laughs> all right, turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs chapter 18. I will share some things with you in these four sessions that we have together from the topic of the power of positive confession, but there is no way that I can completely exhaust even the material that I have about it because it's very involved. But I hope to leave you with some things that you can add to your store of knowledge that will take you and move you on to the next level. Is that okay? Now, don't overwhelm me with your enthusiasm. <laughs> I'm the kind of a uh, teacher that when I ask you a question, I like to hear a response. I want to be sure you're all still awake. Because if you like the folk in California, some of them have mastered the art of going to sleep with their eyes open. <laughs> if, you, if you've ever seen me on TV, you'd notice I walk. And the reason I do that is because to get people to be sure they're still awake. Because... <laughs> I don't know about anybody else. I don't have any time to waste. Do you, did you, do you know that yesterday is gone forever? I said it's gone forever. It'll never come back. So I got to make, as they say, hay while the sun is shining. So I got to be sure that my time spent with people is advantageous and beneficial to them because I don't have time to play games. Okay? So, we're going to move on. So, when I ask you a question, I would like for you to respond. I think that would be all right with you. Praise the Lord. All right. All right, Proverbs chapter 18. If you have it, see I have it? All right. Good. Verse 21 it says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Now, this particular verse of Scripture is an astounding revelation. Listen to this, death and life. What else is there? That covers the gamut, doesn't it? Death and life. But listen to this, listen to this. Death and life are not in the power of God. Look at the verse. It doesn't say death and life are in the power of God. It doesn't say death and life are in the power of Jesus. It doesn't say death and life is in the power of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say death and life is in the power of Satan. It says death and life is in the power of the tongue. That's incredible. And those who love it 
will eat its fruit. In other words, you're going to eat the fruit of what you speak. Death in life. I love that because it tells me that I am the architect of my own destiny. Now, that does not say that God is not in the mix. Don't misunderstand me. But he made us with free will so we can obey or disobey. We have that choice, and he'll allow us to do it. We see it all the time. So he's put principles into his word that we can take and operate in and through these principles to bring about what God intended in the first place for his creation of us, abundant living in every area of life. So he says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. So that means you can speak death to your life or you can speak life to your life. It's your choice. I didn't always know that, and in the average church, unfortunately, I don't mean this as a put-down, but as an observation, because I, I matriculated through four different denominations over a 17-year period, trying to find some semblance and some, something out of all these different things people were telling me, but nobody was telling me how to do anything. I just kind of have to, you know, just make it on my own. And, and I never knew this. They didn't tell me. And I spoke, just like most people, I talked the circumstances. 24-7, 365, because I thought it was the norm, because everybody was doing it. Everybody was doing it. And when I found this out, I realized why the noose had been wrapped around my neck. I wrapped it around my own neck, and I didn't even realize it. See? Now, Satan will take advantage of that, obviously, and tighten the noose until it chokes your life out of you. But you're the one that sets the stage, and I like that. I'm not a victim of the circumstances. Uh, I'm not a leaf blown from the trees by the mighty winds of time. I am my own architect based on God's word and the principles that he has set in his word. Can't do it without him. Can't do it without Jesus. Can't do it without the Holy Spirit. But God has put his will in his word. And so when we operate by that word, we will benefit everything he says in his word. Now, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life. So I chose and I choose to speak life to my life and rather than death. And many times, because we don't understand, we think that when we tell or say what we see around us, that we're being honest about it, not realizing that we're falling into the trap of wrapping the noose around our own necks and choking our lives out of ourselves, and there's nothing Father God can do about it because we are the ones that are in control. Notice. Look at it again. Death and life are not in the power of God, in the power of the tongue. And that is because that's how he operates. Have you ever, um, <laughs> have you ever read the book of Genesis chapter 1? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You ever, anybody ever read that? You, you, you have read that? Yes. And, and you know, you, 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 you get in there and you start reading and, and, it, and it said in, and God said, and God said, and God said, and God said, and God said. I know when I first got saved and started reading the Bible, I, you know, I had a problem with that. I wondered, what is all of this? And God said, and God said, and God said, and God said. I mean, if I had been writing the Bible like any intelligent person, I would have written it like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, water, land, animals, man, and we would have had a catalog of what was created. What's with all this? And God said, and God said, and God, who's he talking to anyway? And God said. But one day, the Spirit of God revealed to me, opened my eyes of understanding, because I wanted to know, and he said, Fred, the reason, the reason that it says, and God said, and God said, is because if you'll notice something very carefully, notice that nothing came into existence until after God said it. Now, you would have thought that because he was God, he could have just projected a thought. Mm. <laughs> Dry land. Mm. Ocean. Mm. Animals. You know, you would think, you know, he could just think. It. But that's the way it works. That's the way he's designed the system to work. It's, it's voice activated. And if you don't want to say it, you will go without it. Say it based on the word. 
Now, we want to talk about the power of positive confession. Now, I need to clarify the word confession because ordinarily in the English language, the word confession connotes a negative. All right, fess up, you did it, tell the truth, you know, that type of thing. And so we think of confession, and then if you're in a particular denomination, again, please believe me, I don't mean any harm or trying to come down on anybody, but there is a particular denomination, and, and one of their great things is this thing about confession, confessional. You go into the little box, the little room, and so forth and so on, and you confess when you've done something wrong. Okay, I'm not knocking it. I'm just trying to show you that the word carries with it in our English Western civilization the idea of always something negative. But that's not what the word means in the New Covenant. In the New Testament, the Greek word for our English word confession is uh, homologeo or homologio, which however way you want to pronounce it. And what it literally means is to agree with or say the same thing God says. That's what confession that's what Bible confession means. It means to agree with or say the same thing that God says. Whatever God says, I say. When I say what God says, I'm making a positive confession. When I say what God didn't say, and I don't say what God said, then I'm making a negative confession. I'm speaking death to my life, or I'm speaking life to my life. So when you hear that word in the context of our time together, when I say confession, it's not about confessing negative. Now, if you've done something negative, well, you've got to fess up to it. But you shouldn't be doing that much as a Christian spirit-filled, Bible-toting believer. You shouldn't spend that much time confessing bad stuff. You're not supposed to be doing any bad stuff, right? Yeah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. So, so don't, get, don't be afraid of the word confession. It simply means to say or agree with what God says. Now, how can I agree with what God says when I don't know what he said? Amen. And it's a sad commentary on the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ after 2,000 years that most Christians worldwide are defeated in life because they don't know what his word says and they don't ever confess his word. They confess the 6 o'clock evening news version of life. instead of confessing what the Word says. So, we're going to talk about this. Now, whenever something occurs in our life, let, let's say, let's just use sickness, for instance, because it's amazing with all of our technological advancements, the Internet and digital and all this other stuff, they haven't gotten rid of disease yet. Folks still sick. Folks still die of debilitating ailments. People live in pain and all kind of uh, deprivation all their lives. So it's, it's still around. So I want to I wanna use that one because we run into it so often. So when, when something comes up like sickness or disease or something like that, we have to think about three different things. Number one, first of all, what does God say about the affliction? What does God say about the condition? Then number two, we have to think about and ask the question, what does Satan say about the sick condition? He says you're sick. You're going to die. It runs in the family. You know, Grandpa died of that. Great, great granddaddy died of that. And it's probably going to, you're going to probably die with that. So it's what he says about it. Then the last thing is, thirdly, what do you say about it? There's what God says. There's what Satan says. You are the deciding factor. You stand in the middle to make a decision to go with either what the devil says through the circumstances or what Father God says through his word. Yeah, but it doesn't make sense. I know it doesn't. You're right. You made A+. plus. It doesn't make sense. It makes faith. Amen. Bible doesn't say we walk by sense. It says we walk by faith. Bible says the just shall live by sense. No, live by faith. Now, there's a place for sins, don't misunderstand me, but when it comes to the covenant of God, you can't mix sins and faith together or you get nothing. So what does the word of God say about whatever condition? It could be finances, it could be sickness. I use sickness again because it's so prevalent. But it's what, what do I say about it, what does God say about it, and what does Satan say about it? I stand in the middle of the road and I can make a confession, either agree with God or agree with Satan via or by way of the circumstances. What am I going to go to do? Yeah, but, 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 but nothing. It didn't say death and life is in the power of the tongue, but. It didn't say that. And that's always there, but, but what am I going to say? I say what God says. 
yeah, but, he, but you, don't, you don't look too well. So? What's that got to do with anything? What does the word say? God, the Bible says it's impossible for God to lie. So if God says I'm well, then I must be well. I might not know it yet because I'm not siding in with God and making a confession that's consistent with his word. I don't know how it works. I can't tell you how it works. I don't know how God said, let there be light, and there was light. As soon as you figure that one out, you send me an email, let me know how that works, okay? <laughs> but it, we got light out there, you know what I'm saying? I don't, but we don't have to know. It's always about, well, I don't understand. Well, you don't need to understand. What, what do you really understand? You know, when you really get down to the nitty, nitty, gritty, what do you understand? You know, really, I mean, we're going by what somebody told us. And, and, and to live and operate on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't have to know how stuff works. Just do it. The manufacturer said, press power and the TV will come on. From across the room with a little piece of plastic in your hand, and when you press a button, you don't even see anything coming out of the thing, and yet the TV suddenly comes on. The channel change. Volume up, volume down, etc. I don't have to know. I press the garage door thing and the garage door open. I don't know how. I don't give a care. I'm only concerned when it don't open. <laughs> then I'm upset. <laughs> but you know, I mean, we always, but when it comes to God, we've got to figure it out. We've got to have a schematic diagram. We've got to have an architectural rendering of the whole thing. Just do what the man says. We do what everybody else tells us to do. And we never question it. Have you ever taken a journey on a commercial airline or somewhere, another state or something like that, another country, or vacation or something like that? And, and so maybe you call the travel agent and you find out, okay, I want to go to Hawaii and, and, and we need to, we're going to go for about a week and, and we're going to leave on Monday and, and we want to come back on Saturday evening. Uh, what you got? And so they tell us, okay, we got a flight, so and so and so and so, boom, 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 boom. So we say, okay, book me on that flight. Uh, here's my credit card number. Get the ticket. Get on the airplane. And in most cases, you don't even see the pilot for the whole trip. You don't even see the pilot for the whole trip. But you got all your little stuff in your little bags in the cargo hold. And you don't ask anybody, y'all, show me an air map of the route we're going on. I want to be sure that the pilots know how to get to Hawaii. <laughs> now, American Airlines said this flight goes to Hawaii. How do you know? You don't even fast and pray about it. You just take their word, but when it comes to the word of God, show me a sign, Lord. Let a dog bark the star-spangled banner at midnight, and then I'll know that it's, your word is true. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? It, it's amazing. Kind of like the story I heard about this airline was trying to upgrade to more uh, sophisticated electronic uh, gizmos and gadgets, so they had developed this way of flying an airplane without actually having to have a pilot on board. And they had su supposedly perfected it, so forth and so on. So they announced it, you know, through TV. Everybody wanted to ride on the first transcontinental flight without having a pilot. It's going to be radio controlled all the way, not a problem. So people lined up, bought tickets, got on the board plane, and then people took seat belts, and everybody was excited about it. And then the intercom came and said, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, buckle your seat belts. We're just about ready to taxi out and take off. Enjoy your flight. This has been perfected. We have worked on this for many years now, and we have it down pat, no problems at all. So just sit back and relax and let us fly you to the East Coast, no problem at all. So the, the machine came up and backed the plane out, and the engine started up, and another voice came back on and said, all right, ladies and gentlemen, we're just about ready to take off. So again, be sure your seat belts are uh, fastened, your seat backs are in their upright position, and the tray tables are locked and stored. Very good. We just want you to know that there's not a problem in this. this I told, we told you already this has been perfected. There's not a problem. There is absolutely no way that anything could go wrong, go wrong, go wrong, go wrong, go wrong, go wrong. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? We just trust our lives to people. You ever had an operation where they had to put you under anesthesia and you, you didn't know what they took out or what they put in? And a lot of times, your doctor is not the surgeon. He remands you over to somebody that's a specialist in that area, and they take you and wheel you on a gurney into this little room with all these big lights in there and all these people with the masks on, the green hornets and all that stuff, you know, and then they, they 
stick you with something and say, all right, count back from 100, and about two, minutes, two seconds later, you're out, and then next thing you know, you're in recovery. You don't know what they did to you. <laughs> Only when it comes to God's word do we have to have a sign. You are Christian? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Do you believe the word of God? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. You really, you, you believe the Bible is the word of God? Yes, pastor. You mean you believe the Bible is God's word? I told you, yes. I believe it from Genesis to Revelation. Well, are you healed? No. <laughs> yeah, but the word says with Jesus stripes you were. So if you were, then you are. And if you are, then you is. <laughs> Sounds funny, but Hebrews 11 one says, now faith is. That's where I got that from. But just using that as an illustration. Now, let me get into something here. I hope we can cover this. Now, <clears throat> understand this. The victorious Christian life is based upon a positive confession of four biblical truths. Let me say that again. The victorious Christian life. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been down, and now I'm up, and up is better. I've been defeated, and now I win. Win is better. So I want you to notice how I said this. I said the victorious Christian life. If you just want to exist as a Christian, all oh, praise the Lord so that you can miss hell when you die and go to heaven and you're just going to struggle all the time you're down here. Fine with me. I don't have a problem with it. Just leave me out of the loop. Because I've been there, done that, didn't like it. But I've been over here on this other side winning. I love winning. I like to win. It feels good. Amen. And I found out that I'm supposed to win because my father said so. Yes, he said, he told me to win. So the victorious Christian life is based upon a positive confession of four biblical truths. A positive affirmation of these four facts will compel Satan to acknowledge your authority and victory over him. See, he doesn't want the body of Christ to know that he is already defeated. Jesus whipped upon him at Calvary and three days later at the resurrection. Satan is a defeated foe, but he look, it looks to me like he's ruling the roost of Christianity over most Christians because they're all struggling, scared, you know, every out of control, and they don't know. They're, they're the winners, and Satan is already defeated, but he acts like he's king of the hill. Amen. And most Christians buy into that lie. But we, we win. But you won't win unless you say you win and say in line with the word of God and then put all the other things in their proper place walking by the word. But if you will acknowledge these four things that I'm going to share with you in a moment, it will compel Satan to acknowledge your authority and victory over him. This will in turn have the effect of breaking the enemy's power to bind, to hinder to oppress you and yours. God expects us to confess four biblical truths. Ready? Number one, what we are in Christ. What we are in Christ, or are we anything? Many Christians say, well, I'm just, an old, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace, which is a lie. I mean, they don't even, people say things and they wonder why their lives are no better because they say stupid stuff that they heard some other stoop say. Really, think about it. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. That's a lie. How can you be a sinner and saved? <laughs> what? Yes, I used to be a sinner. Yes, I was saved by grace, but I am no longer a sinner. I am saved. I'm the righteousness of God. To say I'm a sinner saved by grace is to acknowledge you're still a sinner. That's why it's so easy for you to sin. Hallelujah. Yeah, that's why it's so easy for you to keep telling them lies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, praise the Lord. Glory to God. Yes, I know. Okay, what we are in Christ. Secondly, where we are in Christ. Where are you? Or do you know where you are in Christ? It's awesome. 
Number three, you ready? What we possess or what we have in Christ. Most Christians, they have no, they don't have a clue that they have anything. Most Christians think they're going to get it when they get to heaven. So they're waiting over there on the other side of the sweet by and by. How about the sweet down now? And it's so, I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling. Jesus said it in John 10.10. 10. We always, most Christians harp on the first part of John 10.10 10, where it says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And then we have, we, they, 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 they get on that. They, they, they forget about the rest of the verse. The man said the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come Amen. that they might have life. And that would have been enough. That would have been enough. I've come that they might have, and have it, it what? Life, more what? Life, abundantly. Are you there? I asked, I, I taught a lesson not too long ago, a series, and I asked my congregation, it was absolutely mind-boggling. I asked, I used this John 10, 10. I said, okay, now the word says, Jesus said to himself, this out of the mouth of Christ himself, he said, the thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So I asked the congregation, I said, okay, can we get a consensus of opinion? What is the definition of abundance? Can we get a, a consensus of opinion, something we can all agree on? What is abundance? Well, we came up with this. I see how it sets with you. Everybody basically agreed, okay, abundance means more than enough. Can you agree with that? Abundance means more than enough. Not enough. More than enough. Because Jesus himself said it. I came that you might have life and have it life more. Abundantly. So then I asked this question. I don't know if I, have to, if I should ask it here. But I asked this question. I said, okay. How many of you have been a member of Crenshaw Christian Center? Or some other church that was a teaching ministry? And you have been walking in the word for at least 10 years. Could be more, but at least 10 years. Almost every hand in the building went up. Then I asked the question, how many of you are living in more than enough? Had about six hands. So there's something wrong with that picture. I mean, how long does it take to get into abundance? You've been there 10 years and you're not there yet. And our Savior said he came that you will have life and have it more abundantly. As far as I'm concerned, it is an affront to his credibility for me to live less than the best. Amen. Amen. So what do we have or do we have anything? And fourth, what we can do. Can I do anything in Christ? What, 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 what can I do? Now, number one, you ready? Number one, where? Let's start with that one. Where you are in Christ, to make it personal, where you are in Christ. This has to do with your standing. How do you stand with God? Sometimes you hear people say, well, you know, heard you, heard you and Joe Mary or whatever, I heard y'all had a falling out. How do you stand with them now? You ever hear that expression? How do you stand with so-and-so? Well, this has to do with your standing. You have a standing with God through Christ based on the word. But you'll never enjoy that standing if you, number one, don't know it, and number two, if you don't say it. You have to speak it out. That's what activates the system. And a lot of Christians, because they don't understand that, just like with me, they'll, I've had people, I, I mean, I've been castigated and talked about by professionals. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, and a lot of people, because they don't understand their thing, they'll, they'll say that I'm a braggadocious, they'll say that I'm arrogant and all that kind of stuff. Well, you know, I, I can't help it because they're ignorant. And I just pray for them. But see, what they don't know is all I'm doing and have been doing since I found out about this is saying what the Word says. And because it's unfortunately so far and few between that you hear those who supposedly are to teach us and shepherd us tell us about what the Word says, they'll say, well, now our denomination believes it this way. 
to be as kind as I can, hang your denomination. Amen. Now notice, notice I didn't mention any names. <laughs> I, uh, watch it and I didn't call any names. You don't know who I'm talking about. See? So don't get upset. Hey, he shouldn't say that. I didn't mention your name, did I? <laughs> Must have been talking about you for you to respond like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And see, nobody would have been the wise if he had shut your mouth. <laughs> but it's the truth. I told you, I went to church for 17 years, four different, denomin four different denominations. They never told me anything about any of this. They didn't tell me anything about death and life was in the power of the time. They didn't tell me anything about winning. They just said to hold on to God's unchanging hand. <laughs> Anybody ever heard that expression? And that wouldn't have been so bad if someone had told me where his hand was so I could get a hold of it. Where? Where? You know, all cliches. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. The Lord won't put on you any more than you can bear. Lord, have mercy. Okay, where you are in Christ. This has to do with your standing. Listen to this. You are everything that the Word of God says you are. You are not that because you are presently experiencing that. You are that because that's what's been bought and paid for for you by our Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says, I mentioned it a moment ago, the Bible says in several places it's impossible for God to lie. My understanding is that the alternative to a lie must be the truth. So if God can't lie, then he must tell the truth. So if he says I'm something, that must be who I am. Yeah, but I don't feel like it. See, that's our problem. See, we, see, we want to see it and feel it and touch it before we believe it. That's not faith. I have to start acting on what the Word says before I'll see or experience what the Word says about me. That's why death and life's in the power of the tongue. So I've got to say what God says, even though I don't look like it and even though I don't feel like it. I don't know why it works that way, but it does, and I really don't care. I'm interested in it working because I went for so many years where nothing worked. <laughs> Every day was a bad day. It was just survival. Amen. And, you know, I wanted the Lord, come Lord Jesus. The only reason you want Jesus to come is because life is whipping your backside and beating up on your head. No, I'm serious, because once you learn how to operate in that abundant life that Jesus had, you're not, in, you're not, you're not anxious to leave here. Why would you want to leave when you just now found out how to live? And only then will you be in position to be able to be a channel through which Father God can work to win others to the body of Christ. The world needs to see some winners. Not a bunch of whiners, criers, and bellyaching, always bellyaching about what you don't have, what you can't do, scared of this, scared of that, scared of the other. Amen. And that was me. <laughs> Notice W-A-S was me. That was me. When I found this out, I started saying what God said about me. So, everything or everywhere the Lord, the Word of God says you are, that's where you are. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's look a few, uh, at a few scriptures here. Ah, I'm doing pretty good. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Everything the Word says you are, you are. Everywhere the Word says you are, you are. Everything the Word says you have, you have. Everything the Word says you can do, you can do. But you'll never experience any of it until you start doing it. And the first thing you do is... Speak it. Starts out by speaking. Okay, I, I take you back again to Genesis chapter 1. As far as we know, based on the Bible record, there was no dry land until after God said it. That's the way he's designed the system to work. It's activated by our words. If you don't know that, then you end up saying what the circumstances say, which are controlled and monitored by Satan, so you end up saying things that are contrary to what God says, and you're speaking death to your life and wondering why it's happening. Amen. Well, it must be the will of the Lord. No, 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 no. Not in the sense you think of it, the will of the Lord. No, no, not his decreed will. His permissive will, absolutely. 
<laughs> if you stop and think about it, every single thing that happens on the earth must be his permissive will, or how could it happen without him not stopping it? So when people kill each other, God's permitting it. But he didn't decree it. Big difference. Because he made us what's called free moral agents, meaning we are responsible for our actions. We have the power of choice. Wow. You still here? Okay, 2 Corinthians. If you have it, say I have it. All right. 2 Corinthians, and we will look at chapter 5. Did I tell you 5? Okay. Look at verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... Now, I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. You may be using the traditional or another translation, but it, it all will end up in the same place. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The tradition says creature, but it's creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, did God lie? Okay, watch it now. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, are you, are you in Christ? If so, then you are a new creation, a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, that has to be qualified, because if you don't understand that, you think that it's all new physically. I did. I thought it at first, because I went to a particular... I, I wasn't brought up in the church. I married my wife. She was from a very... Uh, 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 from a, a denominational background almost all her life. My mother and father were Jehovah's Witnesses. And then, by the time I got up to about junior high age, they didn't even practice that very well. You know what I mean? So I didn't have any... I don't, I, I don't say that to put anybody down. I just simply so you know where I'm coming from. And, and so I didn't have any guidance or, you know, any inspiration or anything. And so I had to kind of, you know, make it on my own. And, and so uh, I have always been a connoisseur of the feminine form. <laughs> I like things that are beautiful, from airplanes to cars to rings and jewelry and to females. Males, yeah. <laughs> I'll leave that to you. <laughs> but seriously, but I, you know, I had this thing for girls. I was, for some reason, I didn't like boys. I like girls. And so when I got saved, I'm talking about this. What we just read, new creature in Christ. That's where that's that that that's where I am. That's who I am. I'm a new creature. You are too. But if you don't know that, and you don't know how to deal with that, the devil can keep you on a string the rest of your life. And so I accepted Christ. I had a real dramatic experience of rebirth and call to the ministry almost around the same time. And so when I, when I accepted Christ, I was, I was saved. It was like the whole world was different. The sky looked skyier. <laughs> the grass looked grassier. I'm serious. I mean, thing just, everything just was beautiful, you know. And, and, and where, where before if a, an attractive female crossed my path, I was on what was called reckless eyeballing. I'd follow sister until she was out of sight. Well, once I got saved, I just somehow knew I shouldn't be doing that, and then I was married too. So, so, so I, I, my, my head wouldn't even turn. I mean, Lady Godiva could have come down the street riding on her white horse, stark naked, it wouldn't, even, wouldn't have got my attention. Whereas before, I'd have been on the back of the horse with her. <laughs> oh, y'all, don't, don't play me. Hey, come on now. Let's be real. Anyway, I, I, was, I was new. But you see, I did not know that what I saw in the mirror was not me. I didn't know that what I was looking at was merely the house I lived in that I was back here on the inside looking out through these windows. I didn't know the churches that I went to right after my conversion. They didn't tell me that I was a spirit, that I had a soul and I lived in a body. I thought what you saw was what I was. And so for that, about six weeks, everything was cool. I wouldn't look at nobody. Then after about six weeks, I, I noticed a kind of twitch. <laughs> when an attractive female would go by... 
Now, I'm not saying that to be funny. I want to show you a point now about that scripture. And so then I would turn and I would look. Then I would be smitten on the inside. No, I ain't got no business looking at that girl and thinking thoughts like that. And then I was so ashamed of myself. So then I went to the Lord and I said, Lord, forgive me. And I got the forgiveness. I didn't really know how to even receive that, but I, I, I felt better for one of a better way to say it. And so I went on for another couple of weeks and then Sister Fine would walk by again <laughs> and the head would start twitching. Then you know what happened? After a while, I did it so much, I felt hypocritical. And after that, I wouldn't even ask God to forgive me anymore. Wow. So then I lived in guilt and condemnation because I didn't know that I was a new creature. I thought this body was me. So I yielded to what it wanted to do. You know, I mean, in terms of physical things out there. And then I really got the revelation. It, it says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature of creation. You've got to understand what that means. You're not new in your body. You're the same old you you've always been. That's why we're always see, hearing stuff about ministers and, and Christians and messing up. Because mm -hmm, you're, still, you're still who you are. Your body has never been changed. And you need to know that because your body will do anything you let it do. Your body doesn't know any difference between your husband and that other guy or your wife and that other girl. Turn the lights out. Hey, <laughs> let's party. Because it's the man, on, it's the real you on the inside. You can, it's easy to tell. Watch. I thought at first that it was physical. And then that's what had me all confused because I couldn't understand if I'm a new creature, why do I think like this? Why am I attracted to that if I'm a new creature? See what I mean? And so I didn't realize I was new on the inside. But then the, the revelation came and I realized, my God, all you got to do is use a little thinking. Just a little thinking. A little thinking. Not a lot of thinking. Just a little thinking. Now, don't take this personally. I don't mean this to be funny. It sounds funny, but it's a truth I'm trying to get across. <laughs> if you were bald-headed the day before you accepted Christ, watch this now. I didn't say it to be funny. You're bald-headed the day after, unless your hairpiece from Hair Club for Men arrived by FedEx. <laughs> I didn't say it to be funny. If you had dentures that the dentist gave you that your mama didn't give you from her womb the day before you accepted Christ, you still got dentures the day after. Mm -hmm. Think about it. I didn't, I didn't think about that. You got freckles the day before, you got freckles the day after. Well, if the old things had passed away, the dentures should have passed away. The ball should have passed away because you came here with hair. <laughs> but it doesn't pass away. And so then I realized I'm new on the inside. So what is that talking about? Old things have passed away. What old things? Spiritual death. Alienation, separation, and sin consciousness. That's what passed away when you became a Christian. All things have become new. I am righteousness conscious. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. I am the image of God in Christ. I'm not the old person I used to be. And when I found that out, I kicked Satan in his backside because I found out how to win. And I began to say what the Word said. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. And that death doesn't always mean physical death where you go to the graveyard. It could be the death of a relationship. It could be the death of a marriage. It could be the death of a parent and child relationship. It could be the death of many things other than just physical death. So I began to say, that's why I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. So that's how, I've, that's how I've stayed out of scandal all these years. You'll never, you, you, they'll, be, they'll be throwing snowballs in hell when you ever read about this man messing up. Now, see, when I say things like that, people, oh, there you go, there you go bragging again. That's what I tell everybody. He wouldn't be so bad, but he's so braggadocious. No, dummy, you just don't know the principles that operate in the Word of God. I have to say what the Word says if I expect to live that and experience that. And the reason for it is because I don't choose to mess up, and I found out I don't have to mess up. I don't have to, because I'm a new creature. But I had, to, I had to know that's where I am in Christ. I'm a new creature. So there are many things that come my way. I just pass them by. Passe vous. Pass on by. I don't have to do that. I get all kind of, I could have been screwed up and messed up so long ago. You know, opportunities come. I had a girl come in my office one day. Golly. This girl, you know, I doing counseling, you know, counseling people. And, and this young lady came in and, you know, not, you know, I mean, you know, she was not a nice looking little girl. Came in, sat down in the chair across the desk. I said, now, my opening remarks always with someone is, well, now, how, how may I help you? And so she scooted the chair up close to the desk and put her elbows on the desk and looked me right in the eye and said, I want you. <laughs> and guess what my flesh said? I want you. 
Got a couch right over there. Close the blinds. Lock the door. The secretary won't know what I be about in there. I said, you know, I think our session is over. It was nice chatting with you. I got up, went to the door, said, see, your flesh hadn't changed. You, you sitting there lying to me, trying to play the kid. Hey, I've been there and done that. You know, come on. That flesh is, hey, it'll still, yeah, it'll pop them pills. It'll go talk to the pusher and it'll do, all, it'll do all that stuff. The little, little flask, you know, the, the little flask in your pocket or purse, you know, if you let it. But because I know, hey, that's not me. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. I can't do that. That's below my dignity. I'm a child of the king. I have to say that. Not necessarily to people, but I have to say it out loud. Watch this now. I have to say it out loud so that I can participate in another biblical law. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It never says who you had to hear it from. You can hear it out of your own mouth. In fact, that ought to be the mouth that you trust more than my mouth. So you got to say it. That's why death and life is in the power of the tongue. So I got to say it. I'm a new creature in Christ. I'm above that. I don't care what the flesh wants to do. My flesh is not me, and my flesh doesn't control me. I control it. I meaning the man on the inside who's been made a new creature in Christ. All right, let's look at something else. Colossians chapter, <laughs> Colossians chapter 1. You still here? Yeah. All right. All right. Power of positive confession. Ah, got a few minutes more. Colossians chapter 1. I am everything God says I am. I have everything God says I have. I am where God says I am, and I can do everything God says I can do. Now, I'll never experience that. You'll never experience that until, first of all, you know it, believe it, and begin to confess it. That's how faith is activated by the words of your mouth. Let me give you a principle. You may already know it, but it'll be a good review. Your faith will never rise above the level of your confession. Let me say it again. Your faith will never rise above the level of your confession. In other words, you're saying. That's where your faith is going to operate, at the level you confess. If you say, well, I'm weak and I can't do it. Now, see, when people don't understand spiritual principles, they think you're trying to talk psychology. I'm not knocking psychology. Don't misunderstand me now. But we're not talking about that. See, remember, <laughs> if anything, God did not borrow anything from the psychologist. The psychologist borrowed from God because God was here first. So there may be some things that sound alike and that are similar, but that don't make it so. So when we talk about this, we're not talking about some kind of psychological aberration or something like that. No, no, we're talking about the Word of God, and this is the way it's activated. Because remember, Satan is a copycat. He's not a creator. He's a deceiver, a liar, the father of it. He is not creative at all. And he'll take things and misconstrue them and make you think, oh, yeah, that's that. Mm, no, what does this say? Do you, you have Colossians yet? Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. It says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness. Context reveals that it's talking about Father through Christ. He has delivered us. He, he, he is not delivering us, present tense. He's not going to deliver us, future tense. It says he has, has his past tense. Done deal. Time of action already taken place. He has delivered. So that means Satan is not my God. Satan is not my control source. Satan has no legal right to tell me what to do because I have been delivered. Here it is right there. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed or translated us into the kingdom of the son of his love. That's where I am. I'm in Christ. I'm in the center of the family of God. I don't care what the enemy comes at me with. I say, no, 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 no. Can you read, devil? If you can, I'll read it out loud to you. See, he had delivered us. That us is me. 
See, you need to make everything in the covenant personal. See, you need to make it personal. Wherever it says we, that talking about you. When it says us, talking about you. You have to make it personal. You have, to, you have to say it. You have to confess it. Death and life. In the power of the tongue. And we pick up, I'm telling you, it's amazing. We pick up stuff. That's why I don't listen to the news. Now and then when I'm in my car, we have a, we have a 24 hour a day, a couple of stations in L.A. that that's all they do is the news. News, traffic, and weather. That's all they do. But just watch the, watching the news because it's all bad news. And if they, if they ever say anything positive, it's usually at the last two or three seconds of the program, and they laugh about it when the commentators are telling you about it. So why listen to that garbage day after day after day? Now, periodically, as I said, in my car, I'll listen to the news just to find out what's going on in the world, just to get a little brief temperature of what's happening, but just to sit there and listen to that stuff all day long and every single day, it's all bad news. Somebody kills somebody. Who cares? It's not helping me. Listen to the word of God. That's why God invented cassette tapes. <laughs> God invented cassette tapes to promote the word. God invented CDs to promote the word. God invented DVDs to promote the word. But the Christians are so stupid that they let the world pirate all of God's ideas and make a fortune on it, and you're too cheap to even go out and buy a CD or a DVD of a message. Thinking, I can remember what that man said. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I said it, and I can't remember everything I said. <laughs> so, I'm, we've been delivered. All right, look at this. You're in Colossians. Look at chapter 2. I am, I have, and I'm where God says I am. And I can do whatever God says I can do. Not because I'm presently doing it, but because that's how he's made me. Now, I have to begin to, I have to know it first, and I have to begin to confess it. You talk yourself right into it. Because you've got to reorient yourself. Because we've, we've been hearing primarily negative stuff all our lives. You know, even in coming out of homes where there was a bad situation in the, in the home. And, you know, well, you, you're going to be just like your old daddy. He was old wino. You're going to be a wino. And your mama got pregnant when she was 12 years old. You're probably going to go out there and do the same thing. We hear all, you know, kind of things like that. Sometimes parents think that they're, they're trying to help their kids by telling them all that negative stuff, and it doesn't always work. And so we're bombarded all the time with negativism. Got to get the word of God. And you have to begin to say it enough so that your ear gets attuned to hearing what thus says God. Amen. Not the circumstances. We don't deny, listen carefully now, we don't deny the circumstances. What we deny is the circumstances right to tell us how to live our lives. Amen. You get the difference? Yeah. Circumstances are real. <laughs> Let me show you how real they are. Those are flowers. That's a circumstance. They're really there for me to say, the flowers are not there. There are no flowers. I don't see green. I don't see flowers. That's stupid. <laughs> Better known as dumb and dumber. <laughs> so we, we don't deny the reality in existence. I just deny them the right to go home with me tonight and sleep in my bed with me. In other words, I deny their right to have any influence on my life, apart from what I might smell and view, that's it. But we don't deny the things that we see. All right, Colossians, what did I say? Chapter, chapter 2, you still here? Yeah. You getting anything out of this? Yeah. All right, all right. Okay, let's see, where do I want to go? Okay, all right, watch this now. Oh, jeez. You know, I don't know if I ought to read this. Now, I don't really, I'm, I, I, I'm not trying to be funny, but no, 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 no. Wait, listen, listen. Because after we read this, you are going to be held accountable for what you do with it. Be, it would be better to stay ignorant. <laughs> then you could tell the Lord, I didn't know that, Lord. I didn't know that. <laughs> All right, you asked for it. Here it goes. Colossians chapter what? Two. 2, verse 9 and 10. For in him, context will let us know it's Christ, 
in him, for in him dwells all the fullness of God bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. You are complete. Did God lie? No. Well, then why are you whining and complaining about what you not, what you don't have, and what you can't do? What does complete mean? What's the definition of complete? What? Lacking nothing. I like that. So well, why are you whining and crying about what you can't do and what you don't have and all this stuff? We're complete in him. But I have to begin to say that. And like I said, the average Christian and most people in the Christian community, unfortunately, because they don't know these truths, they will accuse you of being a braggart. They'll accuse you of being arrogant and all that. You know what? Call me whatever you want while I'm making my fifth deposit for the week into the bank in my personal account. <laughs> you know, call me what you want. I don't have no problem with it. Because you know, what you call me is your problem, not mine. What would become my problem is if I believe what you said about me. And I say, I can't control what you say. I don't care what I do, somebody won't like it. So, I choose to say what the Word says. All right, let's look at something else. Hi. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. I got to go, I got to cut some of it. I can't get it all in. Uh, we're talking about our standing, where we are in Christ. All right, go to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. I am, I have, I can do, and I am where God says I am. I started confessing that in 1970. I got a hold of this. I started saying it. It's, it's, it's incredible. You have, to, you have to experience it. But it's a lifestyle. It's something you do 24-7, 365. And you can't let the circumstances... I don't care what they look like. You can't let them be the determinant as to how you see yourself. You have to let God's word reveal who you are. And you have to, oh gee, you have to stay with it until it produces results. And see, our, our society is so, everything is, is, um, is microwave, instant this, instant that, instant other. There is no instant success. You will pay your dues. You need to pay your dues so that when you get to the finish line and you're the winner, you can appreciate having won. Are you following me? When I say pay your dues, it simply means you've got to go through the process, starting out and staying with it till it begins to produce. Now, just to give you a good illustration. <laughs> My wife and I, we first got married, I came out of a dysfunctional home. And, and I was out of control. I, we didn't have that much money, but the little we had, I spent it. I bought every new toy that came. Oh, my God, it plays in reverse. I got to have one of those. If I don't get that now, they're not going to be making it anymore. I know the kids need clothes for school. I know September's coming up. I know they need new clothes, but I got to have that. It plays in reverse. And all, all that, now, so I kept us in debt. Finally, I got tired of it. I said, I'm, I'm, it's over. I'm done. I, don't want to, I want out now. Well, the thing about it is I didn't get into it now. I worked on that for years, screwing up our finances, messing it up with my so-called smarts. Uh -huh. And so we decided we want out. And we found, about, found out about tithing, didn't really know really how to deal with it. But, but we saw it said, you're cursed with a curse. Just that part of it right there, I didn't like. You know, curse would have been bad enough, but curse with a curse? <laughs> Give it a rest. Are you kidding me? I mean, you know, just curse sound bad, but curse with a curse? I said, no, we want out. So we, 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 we got a hold of the tithe, and we, we knew it was 10%. Now, we, we weren't making it on 100% of the little bit of income we had. We weren't making it. We were struggling. Our struggles had struggles. And so we said, how are we going to make it on 90%? But I said, we, we got together and we agreed, well, it couldn't be any worse than now because now is not working. <laughs> now is definitely not working. So if we go somewhere else and it doesn't work, we haven't lost anything. So we decided to tithe. So we started tithing. We found out, he said, 
give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And all those good things about giving and, and then tithing. The Father said, I'll open the windows of heaven. And, and so we started tithing. 1967. 1967. And we started sowing that seed with, I mean, literally trembling, trying to figure out how we're going to make it on 90%. Well, I wasn't I paying all the bills anyway, so what's the difference? I, wa I, wanted to, I wanted to get into a position where I could pay everybody and get them off my back. Anyway, we started tithing 1967, and we started confessing the word. We believe we received the return. We believe that we received the windows of heaven blessing. It didn't happen overnight. Like I said, we didn't get into the problem overnight. Most people don't get into their problems overnight. Been working on them. That lousy marriage you have right now, you've been working on that for years. You got that thing so screwed up. <laughs> anyway, we won't go there, will we? Hallelujah! Praise the Lord. Anyway, so we started tithing. Watch this now. Watch this now. We were struggling with 100%. Now we're going to give 10% and we're going to have to survive on 90. How are we going to make it? Well, we're going to do what God said. And then, of course, later on I found out what the word really said about certain things, about giving, so forth and so on. So we got, it got so good to us, we started tithing. Then we said, you know what, this is good. We're going to bump this up to 12.5%. Now, we know tithe technique is 10, but we use the principle of percentage. So 12.5%. Then it got so good, we went to 15%. Then we went to 20%. Then we went to 25%. Then we went to 30%. Then we went to 35%. Right now, today, we give away 40% of all of our money, all of our income. Now, I only use that as a, a real-life illustration to show you we live better on the 60% that's left over, then we would have lived on the 100% and robbed God. But we had to say it and then do it. Faith is acting on what you believe. So if we believe it, we got to do it. So I just use that just as one personal illustration. And it's amazing. I, my wife and I are amazed. We wonder sometimes, how does it work? I don't know. I mean, I don't know how it works. All I know is it works. And I like it so well, I'm going to just keep on working it. Amen. Amen. So that's the first thing, where we are. There's some other things I have to say about that, but I, I really don't have the time. But you have to see yourself as Father sees you. Everything God says you are, you are. Everywhere God says you are, you are. Everything God says you have, you have. Everything God says you can do, you can do. You may not be presently experiencing that but death and life in the power of the tongue not in the circumstances so i'm out of time and we'll pick up here tomorrow evening Amen. praise God.